Welcome to the Tambellini Group's New Normal in Higher Education. I'm Rachel Clemens, and joining me here today is Dr. Kimberly Marshall, Vice President of Information Technology Services and Chief Information Officer at Morehouse College. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you, Rachel. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, I'm so glad that you're here to talk to me today. Um, so Kim, Kimberly, as you know, the series is about new normal in higher education, okay. but our topic today is about doing more with less, which, you know, doesn't really seem to be super new. <laughs> Seems like it's a theme that our institutions and our ID departments have been struggling with for, for years now. With COVID-19, though, I think, you know, maybe this trend is a little bit more pronounced. So I want to talk to you about some of those, uh, some of those implications. So my first question for you is this, how has demand for IT services grown since the beginning of 2020? And do you see this as a temporary situation or something that's likely to be a little bit more long lasting? Um, great question. I think the demands for IT was already growing um, pre-COVID, but when COVID came, it kind of gave it a boost in some ways. Um, and I definitely think it will continue to grow. Um, and, and, and I say that, Rachel, because our personal lives and the economy is becoming more digital. Um, we're more automated. And we, we now live in a society where we want everything in one to two clicks. And once you see the impact on technology, um, technology and business, um, education, healthcare, you can't help but to think, um, how can I make it better than before? And to kind of take those things away will kind of put us back in stone age. <laughs> so I, don't, I definitely don't think we're ready for that. And when we add in how technology can affect student success, right. um, which there was a time we didn't even think about technology even facilitating student success or facilitating um, teaching and learning at all, but now it is, it, it is seen as a contributor and we're seeing more students learn and engage using technology and even some of the AI facilitating learning. So I definitely think it's here to stay, but the demand for it is going to be different across sectors starting out once COVID is over, um, but there will still be a demand for the IT services. Do you think so? In addition to that sort of growth that's already ha that was already in the works, are there specific things that you've kind of had you've seen real increased demand for since the start of COVID? I mean, Zoom or or a, an equivalent, a web conferencing platform seems like an obvious one. Are there other things that you've seen? Yeah, there's definitely been you know an increase in Zoom, Microsoft Teams, pretty much every web platform that you can think of. <laughs> There's an increase, um, you know, not just in higher ed, but also in K through 12. Um, we're dealing with more, especially in higher ed, we're not used to the remote working from home, whereas corporate was already used to that. That's something even after COVID is over, I think that higher ed is going to have to look into um, more um, with remote work from home, um, satisfaction and, of employees, um, even, you know, experiencing COVID, um, take myself along with a lot of my other colleagues, we feel like we're, you know, we're just doing more than ever before being on site. So, right. yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about the other side of it now. So we don't demand has was increasing. It's, it's going to continue to increase. What about the funding side? So what I'm seeing, <laughs> yeah, that's, She's like, oh, great funding. Uh, so what I've seen is that, you know, kind of at best case scenario, institutions seem to be holding flat on budgets. At worst case scenario, they're taking some pretty significant hits. I've heard IT cuts as, as deep as, as maybe 20 percent. Um, I'm curious what, what you're seeing, hearing or what you're experiencing yourself with regards to IT budgets. Well, you know, you know, be it small or big, I, you know, I'm reading different things in the articles and I see that several institutions are feeling the pain um, because, you know, if you don't have students on site, you don't have meal plans, you don't have housing, you don't have parking fees, and all of those are stream of revenue that you're going to miss. <laughs> um, so, um, and, and for Morehouse, we did have to make some cuts, you know, in the start of COVID and, you know, in salaries for employees, 
um, and even some, you know, furloughs and things of that nature. But one of the priorities that remain for, for the president and the CFO is, you know, the infrastructure of IT um, so that we can continue to support the students and the faculty. Um, because, you know, without IT, it's, you know, it's just going to be <laughs> hard to be, do, you know, have remote learning or work from home um, or any of those things. But we're definitely feeling the pain. I think now is the time to review our business model, you know, across institutions. Um, I, in my opinion, I don't think cuts is going to, is a form of revenue. It's one of those temporary things that give your, give you a boost. Um, but if we're continuing to look at cuts, then we can already tell that they're going to be, a, a, or we already have a revenue issue or some sort. Right. Um, as you know, you've heard many times said that you can't cut or shrink yourself to growth. <laughs> so, but every business, you know, look at cuts and, and have cuts. It's just that we can't continue to cut until we don't have anything. We just have to look at, you know, you know, do we increase tuition. Nobody wants to do that, of course. But <laughs> but one of the things, um, just even from a business perspective, you, you either increase sales, <laughs> you either bring in new business, or you keep the business that you have. So mm -hmm. I know, too, that we would like to do, we would like to keep what we have. So we want to rent mm -hmm. teaching, but we also want to bring in new business, um, new students, um, new type of students, you know, whether that's traditional um, students for online learning. So there's several things that we have to continue to look at besides just cuts. And I think um, COVID, if we, if, you know, if institutions were not already doing that, I'm pretty sure they're doing it now. So you talked about your president. It sounds like your president is, is very strategic when it comes to, to IT, which is, is great. Um, tell me a little bit about Morehouse. I know that Morehouse is, or, or at least um, help me confirm this, Morehouse is an HBCU, which stands for Historically Black Colleges and Universities. Mm -hmm. And my understanding of HBCUs is that they have often historically been, you know, underfunded and had to operate with fewer resources than maybe a non-HBCU peer of a, you know, similar size and composition. Is that sort of correct? Yeah, they're, they're about... Mm, 107 HBCUs where you have maybe 50 that's private and maybe, you know, a little over 50 that's public um, or vice versa. So almost half and half okay. there. Um, so definitely I know for the private institutions, um, we don't get, you know, we don't get funding for the state or anything like that, we were pretty much self-sufficient. <laughs> and um, because we are private, some, um, the tuition sometimes tend to, um, tend to be a little bit higher than your public institutions. So we, re we rely a lot on, you know, tuition for our students, for our business uh, model. And um, sometimes you get funding you know, from federal agencies, um, which, you know, that can come and go um, and it's not always stable. So you're, you know, hoping and praying that if you got it the year before that you're going to get it again. Right. Um, so in, in some aspects, we do feel underfunded and not just inside the college itself, but um, for example, the students that Morehouse are bringing in um, I think about six out of 10 of those students are coming from low income families um, that's making $40,000 or less. So sometimes there's bias in even the lending um, for the loans and the loan premiums to the students. So they never have enough to maybe cover the tuition. Um, so we rely on scholarships and things of that nature. Um, the students expect, you know, discounts to, you know, help them cover the cost, but there's only so many, uh, many discounts that we can give. Um, so in that arena, yes, we are underfunding compared to some of the other institutions out there. 
Um, but, you know, we still go on to produce great men <laughs> of Morehouse. <laughs> um, you know, we have some of the brightest students um, despite their issues. Um, and somehow, you know, we get through it, you know, with, you know, donors such as Oprah, I'm sure you've heard, you know, have donated many times to Morehouse and continue to do so. And even recently with um, Mackenzie Scott donating, um, right. you know, Robert Smith last year, paying those students um, loans and things off. Um, we just had so many gifts to help us. And when you see it on the news, you was like, oh, Morehouse has all this money. <laughs> but what people forget is that, you know, donors can give their money how they choose, um, you know, whether it's restricted or, or not restricted. And most of the time it is restricted to help the students, which for us is a plus because that is that is more men leads to more men graduating and not having to drop out because they can't afford an um, education in Morehouse. So right. all of the donations are very, very helpful um, in supporting our student needs. Yeah, and I know Morehouse does great work. So my question really wasn't about, you know, um, the quality of the education. I know it's phenomenal, but actually the, the resource constrained environment that you work in, I would imagine working in um, an environment like that, that you probably have some strategies and maybe well-honed practices for, you know, stretching your IT dollar. Um, and so I'm curious, you know, what advice or insights would you give other CIOs who are now faced with also having to do more with less? Hmm, I wouldn't say that I'm an expert in that field, but I'm becoming, <laughs> I'm becoming um, a lot more experienced in doing more with less, um, as we have termed it. So for me, I do kind of, and some of my CIO colleagues may already do some of these things, such as we talked about before, partnering with consortiums, um, because sometimes when you buy as a group from vendors, the buying power, you know, you have more buying power um, yep. and you may receive more discounts. So we're doing more of that. But also, um, you know, when I came to Morehouse, just like I would do going to any institution or corporation, is taking a look at what we have as far as the contracts. Um, and renegotiate, renegotiating some of those contracts. And I've been able to do that. And, you know, I won't say save 500 or 600,000, but, you know, kind of put it back in the budget where we're not spending on, you know, project X or item X. And then you just have to prioritize. And then, you know, I always ask the question, even myself, I was like, how do I prioritize the priority? You have so many priorities. You, you know, you have to prioritize the priority. And one of the things that I do with my team, um, for example, with networking infrastructure, you know, I, I have them make a list of priorities, you know, enterprise applications make a, a priority and so on. And then we combined it and we come back and we take a deep look at what is really priority. Um, and, and you have to base that on impact, what's going to be, you know, the significant impact course, um, the strategic goals of the college and what is critical that we can't do without. Because when you're looking at it in a silo, everyone thinks their stuff is priority, right? Right. But when you look at it as a group and you understand the impact of not having something and then your, your little priority is not so um, more of a priority anymore. So, I mean, there's more that we do with that, but that's one of the things um, that we do is prioritize that there's a lot of things that we would like to get to. But the reality is, even if the money was there, you can't do it all in one year. Right. So you just have to prioritize and then you just be transparent, um, you know, with the campus as a whole, because IT can be can be seen as a shop that, you know, eats up a lot of money, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, or a cost center. <laughs> But once you explain it to the campus, you know, why things are needed and why certain amounts are spent, um, and then they understand it more. And just every year for myself, I just kind of do a zero-based budgeting where I'm itemizing. Even though I may already know what I have, I'm right. itemizing year after year for things that may have gotten um, added along the way or things that we don't really need anymore. Um, and one, one of the things that I, many colleges um, already do now is 
we take a look at the purchasing when, you know, different departments are sending in different purchasing. I get to be the, I guess, the, the police of, no, you can't have that. <laughs> no, you can't get this. And, and not just to be mean, but sometimes people don't know that we already have something that will fit their need. Right. And so if you're not doing that, then you end up buying duplicate software. Um, of course, there is not one software that does everything, but we want to make sure that we're maximizing what we already have before we go off on a tangent and buy, buying other things. And then standardizing across the campus when it comes to like desktop and laptops um, could save money. And the reason why is because the more types of desktops or laptops that you have, the variety, the more resources you may need to support it, the parts you have to keep in stock and things of that nature. So we try to standardize um, across the campus so it's easy to support it and we're not just buying different things, hoping that it worked with our platform <laughs> um, and things of that nature. So those are just a few of the things that um, I do. It, it sounds a little easier than it is. <laughs> it's definitely hard to do um, more with less sometimes, but it can be done. Yeah, and those are a lot of those things, you know, shared, you talked about consortiums. We also talk about shared services, relooking at your existing contracts, um, maximizing the use of what you have. Those are those are all things and prioritization, of course, those are all things that we would recommend as well. So it sounds like you are, you are absolutely living the best practices uh, in that area. So my last question for you is this, do you see this trend of, of more demand, fewer resources continuing? And if it does continue, is it is it sustainable or do we need to really rethink, uh, you know, I've never been fond of the expression doing more with less. So do we have to do less with less or do we have to do more but differently? Like, like how do you see that shaping out in the future as we think about the, the new normal? I think um, we can't continue to do more with less. It's not going to be sustainable long term. Yep. Um, as mentioned before, you can't cut your way to greatness. You can't <laughs> shrink your way to greatness. Um, we're just going to have to look at different business models. It's okay to cut sometimes, but that can't be your answer because cut does not equal profitability. Right. <laughs> um, it's just like I mentioned before, it gives you a boost, but we need different types of revenues. Um, and, you know, not that I have all the answers, but I do know that a couple of those things or maybe even three of the things that I mentioned earlier about, you know, retaining our students, bringing in more students and maybe even offering different types of programs um, pre-COVID. And I give you an example, pre-COVID, um, we were already looking into distance learning. Um, and we started a software engineering program. And um, we had a coding boot camp, you know, since COVID has started, which we had already started working on and, you know, launched during COVID. Um, so we're, we're gonna have to kind of keep up with the economy as to what careers are going to be needed um, so that we can offer the type of education that companies are looking for. And even partner with some of those companies where that we're providing professional development to um, even some of their employees. So no, it's not going to be the same sustainable to keep cutting. We're just going to have to have, you know, a different business model, a different business continuity plan. Um, and, and it's my belief that many institutions were doing that or looking into it. Again, I think COVID is just now, you know, putting it on the front Whereas in, in driving it a little bit faster than we, you know, were ready to go um, because we can never plan for something like COVID. You right. know, if you look at people's business plans, continuity plans, you're going to see things about tornadoes, fire, um, earthquakes. And but no one ever thought about, you know, what if this virus or what have you breaks out and we have to go home. Um, so I, I definitely believe we are gonna have a lot of modified business plans, um, continuity plans, as well as, um, you know, if this happened again, 
what can we do better type of situation. Sounds great. Well, all right, you heard, heard, heard it here first. You can't cut your way to greatness. And I think that's, um, you know, that's absolutely true. So thank you for uh, visiting with us today. And thank you for the sage, um, sage advice. Uh, Kimberly, I really appreciate your time. And uh, for everybody watching in, we'll see you next time on The New Normal. Thanks, Rachel.